Hello, hello. Welcome to this episode of the Sanibel Captiva Guide podcast. I'd like to welcome our special guest here, Pete Squibb. He is actually the president of the Sanibel Fly Fishers, which is actually a group on the island. Um, actually, why don't you tell us about that? First of all, I didn't really know when I, I do, I do now, but when I originally moved, I didn't know fly fishing was even the thing. Yeah, I always in thought salt it was, water. I thought yeah. it was just fresh water and street for, for me Streams. from England. You know, that was stream right. stream territory. So anyway, let's go back to the uh, Fly Fishers Club. How did it start? Where did it, uh, what's its origins? Okay. How, how yeah. many members? All okay. the rest of it. It's a, it's a unique little club. Uh, it started in uh, 2001. Okay. And there's a, a, a guy here from uh, Sanibel, Norm Ziegler. Um, <clears throat> he had, as a unique history, he was a writer. Um, he... Um, and because he had and he was in Europe for a long time with Stars and Stripe, he was the outdoor writer for Stars and Stripe. And what magazine. is Stars? And, oh, it's a magazine. It's the magazine okay, I haven't heard of that for the military. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And uh, that's what he was doing. And um, unfortunately, he ended up uh, getting Lyme disease when he was in Europe. Oh, wow! And when he came back to the U.S., uh, it took that time to get it diagnosed, and they found that he couldn't live north so he had to move south right. so he moved to florida he moved to sanibel island back in the uh late um, um 90s okay right. and so he, he's been fly fishing his entire life and and so he started saltwater fly fishing here and uh did a lot of different things he's a writer and um finally ended up opening a shop a fly shop here but he promoted this fly fishing down here, snook fishing on the beaches, which is very unique. It's one of the few places in the country that, that it happens. But he promoted it here and actually built this whole fly fishing in the salt water on the beaches of, of Sanibel yeah. in southwest Florida. Um, but he also was from the old school where fly fish, fishers like to get together fly anglers like to get together. And he started the, the original Sanibel Fly Fishers Club at, on his living room table oh, nice. back in That's 2001 awesome. with him and three or four guys. Oh, and cool. it was a small social club right. for, for many, many years. And then we've, it, over time, it's, it's grown. We've had a, we now have about 110 members, um, half from the island, half from the mainland. Um, it's, a lot of those are transient that are snowbirds, snowbirds. that come and go. Yeah. Um, and we've just did a lot of fishing together and a lot of just BSing type <laughs> stuff. And it's social type, right. communal type stuff. But in the last few years, we decided as a group that let's we need to do something more. Clean water is a major item here in Southwest Florida. It has been for a long time something that Norm had promoted for l as long as he's been here. But um, as a club, we thought, let's give something back. We're a conservation, it's a fishing club, but it's it's tied into the water. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to give something back. So what we have did is that uh, five years ago, we came up with the idea of how can we do that? And the pr original thought was, let's look at, we got, Florida Gulf Coast University right across the creek here. And uh, they've got a lot of research going on. They just put together the water school mm -hmm. and uh, bringing forces together to try to work out a solution to the water problems here. And we thought maybe we can just, as a small club, let's try to raise some money and, and get some scholarships for yeah. at FGCU. We did that, uh, and this was four years ago, we had a first fundraising event. Um, and it was very successful. Just a quick message before we get back to the show. We put a ton of effort into bringing you quality content, so if you would like to help us share our love of the islands, here are several easy ways. Firstly, you can support us on Patreon. You could purchase an island souvenir from our Etsy store. You can metaphorically buy us a coffee, which is an easy way to donate a couple of bucks. Don't you prefer tea? Well, I do, kind of. Also, like and subscribe to our channel to keep up to date with all things Sanibel and Captiva. And finally, show some love to our sponsors. Let them know we sent you. All the links are in the description below. 
now, back to the episode. Um, yeah, I uh, think very successful because you kind of revealed when right. we're off camera. Tell everybody how much you have right. actually we, here. When we started initially that first year, we figured, well, if we could raise $20,000, that'd be really nice. We ended up in the first year raising about one hundred and fifty thousand. Wow, that's dollars awesome. in one fundraising event. Wow. No way. And what, what, what was that what event? Was, what was the event? Yeah, the event was a. It's called F three T. It's a fly fishing, uh, fly fishing film tour. F3. Oh, okay. F three T. F three T. Fly fishing film tour, which is a, a put together in a national type system where it's a two-hour um, combination of videos of fly time fly fishing across the world for saltwater freshwater what have you gotcha and it's a it's been going on for probably almost 20 years now but we got involved with it four or five years ago and it brings a lot of fly fishers together and we thought let's do that and we had it here at the community house we had uh, 200 people showed up. But anyway, we raised, uh, at that event, at one night event, we raised uh, just about $150,000 wow. that, that night. Since then, subsequently, we've built that to just over $340,000, which is a fairly significant, and that's an yeah. endowment now. It's a per, in Perpetual. perpetuity. Okay. And what will that be used for now? And what that's used for is at FGCU, and it's used for scholarships for grad students that are working with it on water quality issues in their grad school. Right. And in the water school. So we're, this last year, now that we're at, at this amount, it's they guarantee 4% a year goes towards the scholarships. Right. And the fund will continue to build whether we put any more in it or not. But so this year we we put out twelve thousand dollars in scholarships. We funded two scholarships for mm -hmm. grad students over there for this year. That's awesome. And That's we've, awesome. we've done Fantastic. about twenty thousand dollars in the last three years. Do you now. know what those grad students are using that those funds for in particular, or you're not sure? Yes, what, that's the nice thing about it is that the students are using that for, you know, it's expensive to do grad work. Right. And most of them are using it for housing to help, you know, they've only got X amount of money. Right. And if they can get an extra six or eight or ten thousand dollars that Just really goes for forward right. for their housing for the year right mm. so Which what it does and that frees up money for that they can put into the research right. projects itself and eases their mind i'm it, sure right right and about, just makes it worry about easy that. that they they understand what it is so that's what we've done with that one mm -hmm. all right let's go back to the club for a minute how do you how what, what's the uh uh, typical meeting. I mean, do you do you meet on a regular basis, or do you? Yes, we meet. Uh, we meet monthly. We meet the second Thursday of each month, and uh, this year we're meeting at the Sanibel Sea School. Okay, we've worked out some pretty close relationships with the Sea School. Um, we help them with some of their uh, summer camp oh, projects okay. that where we go in and spend a day. Teaching. teaching the kids fly fishing oh, cool. and fly tying and things right. like that. Right. And um, so we've gotten a, a pretty good working relationship with them, and, and we have a meeting once a week there. Month. Oh, once once a a month, yeah, once, right. I'm sorry, yeah. once a month. And the sea, sea school is down on the east end of the island, closer to the lighthouse. Right, um, right. Across. On the right hand side as yes. you head yes. towards the lighthouse. Yes, across the, light. yes. the yeah. lighthouse restaurant. Right, right by there, the lighthouse so. restaurant. Yeah. So on those nights, what was it? To, do you have speakers? Do you have. Or do you just, is it just a chance for everybody to get together? I'm thinking or? lots of BS. We, it going is. <laughs> it, it's, we usually have it two hours and we start at six and go to eight. We usually have pizza and drinks there. Um, and we have like a half hour social hour where everybody gets together and and uh, just chit chats right. about what's Talk going about on your and, big and fish. fishing. <laughs> and then we usually, we've got a little bit of a, a business meeting that takes some of that and we update on we're involved with a lot of the legislative stuff going on with water and with FWC, the Fish and Wildlife, or Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission mm -hmm. in with some of the fishing regs. And then we usually have a presentation of some sort. And we, sometimes it's internal 
we've, we've got some really interesting people, as you might guess. Absolutely. You know, when you get yes. a lot of people come to Sanibel, a lot of our folks are retired, mm -hmm. but they have some very interesting careers yes, and things they've done in their life. Career. So we, we pull on that. Plus, they've fished all over the world. Um, so we have just a variety of things that we do. This this next in April, we're having uh, the uh, regional marine biologist from FWC is coming to speak about uh, a new planning project that they have for managing redfish. Oh, cool! cool, cool so cool. We, those are the types of things that we do. Right. Yeah. Um, do you zoom the meetings too for people that can't make it? We we. Did, did for a some of that for a while, and actually, we we actually for went with our meetings during the pandemic because it was just too difficult yeah. right. to find a place that yeah. we could even meet. So we did some Zoom meetings, mm -hmm. but um, and most of the meetings are we have meetings from uh, October through May. Okay, because that's when most everybody's here. here, but we still have occasionally a meeting between May and May and September. Yeah. Um, but then we have a, a, throughout the year, we have a monthly luncheon where we meet somewhere, either on the island or okay. on the mainland. So we'll, one of the restaurants? Right, pick. yeah, and we'll get a dozen, 15, 18 people together. Right. Sweet, that's awesome. So, so uh, women too? Yes, yes, okay. we do, and we, we're actually, you know, that's one of the things, Fly fishing, fishing and fly fishing, one of the fastest growing segments of that are, are women anglers now. Right. And so we're seeing that too. We have uh, probably six or eight out of the hundred mm -hmm. that are, are female mm -hmm. anglers or fly fishers that we have. Um, and mostly at the meetings, we'll have spouses that come. Okay. And, uh, that. and we have some other events during the year. We have a weekly fly tying um, class or not a class, but a, an evening that's uh, the first Tuesday of the month, which oh. would be like next Tuesday. Um, and we have that at the C school, and we'll usually get a dozen people together and just sit around for a couple hours and chit chat <laughs> and tie flies. But so, for those that aren't familiar with uh, fly fishing, particularly saltwater fly fishing, tell us a little bit about the type of species that you're going to catch. You know, is it efficient? Is it as efficient as line fishing? Is it, um, can you do it from a boat? Get, tell, run us through the actual process and what, is it something that somebody could do as a visitor and come and do and learn how to do? Yes, to all of that. Okay. All of that. It, yeah. it is. Which uh, question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. First of all, saltwater fly fishing is really growing quickly. Uh, 40 years ago, there were very few people that saltwater fly fished. Um, mainly because fishing in this country and in, in Europe mm -hmm. has been small stream stuff or lakes for yeah. um, trout. And, uh, you know, in Europe, a lot of times for carp fishing is a, is a big deal there. Uh, and so all of the f fly fishing equipment was geared for small fish which doesn't really work well when you get in salt water because you don't you find big... very many small fish very often. So it's taken a long time to build that interest, but now fly fishing in the salt is a, is a, big, a big time effort. And like I was saying earlier, Norm built a fly fishing interest for snook on the beaches of, of Sanibel. Right, and what, do you know what his book is called? He has several books about fly, do you know the names right. of them? Right, he's or? got, uh, the one is um, uh, Fly Fishing for Snook, okay. which is what? his original one that right. he did, and and he outlines in there how he goes around uh, about fly fishing, sight casting in this clear water for snook, right. which is a real exciting way to catch fish. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult, but it's it's an exciting way. Uh, he's got another couple books. Um, one is, I can't remember the name well, of it. Yeah, we'll link them in the show notes, or if yeah. Max, you can look them up while we're chatting. But it's one on uh, famous people who are also fly fishermen, or fly anglers. And it'll it's surprising who Ooh. is has does <laughs> does do that right so what sort of fish are you so you mentioned snook what else could you expect to catch off of the off of the beaches you can catch um basically anything that's there that's catchable um i i fish i i'm retired 
Okay. <laughs> Lucky. And, and I have been retired for a while. I was a wildlife biologist in my real career. Right. Mm-hmm. And for 32 years with the state of Michigan, and then I, as a consultant, uh, once I retired. So I had another 15 years after that. So for 45 years, I've been a wildlife biologist. And what that has allowed me to do is analyze things, data. And what I do is I keep track of all of my days that I fish and what I catch and sizes and the whole nine yards. I know you fished this morning. You yes. got any data from this morning? Uh, this morning was a little shaky because <laughs> of the winds and stuff. Gotcha. But I knew that I knew that going in. Right. But I've got nine years of data and I've I just just stop teasing us. What can you catch? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay. Just the other day I I I had uh, I've got about twenty seven hundred trips on the water that I've logged in wow. and just past 20,000 fish that I've got logged. Wow. wow. And those, there's 57 species of fish. All but four of those are saltwater fish, just to what give you an idea. Wow. Yeah, what well, you can wow. actually catch. So anything that's, that's here that will eat something else, right. which is basically everything, everything out there in, in the salt water. Mullet? Mullet, I, I usually catch a half a dozen mullet a year almost by accident. They're, uh, okay. they're, um, so mullet, if you didn't know, uh, uh, are, are typically caught by net. Right. They're and they're uh, caught by they're, rod and reel. Right. They're a, um, a, a vegetarian. Mm-hmm. So they, it's very difficult to get them to eat something. They're not attracted to anything in the water other than uh, algae and, and Quick plankton and stuff that they eat. Yeah. But anything else, uh, I uh, snook, um, sea trout, uh, tarpon, redfish, uh, jack crevels, any of the jacks, uh, pompano, uh, permit. Um, we fish out, actually out in the, uh, the Gulf uh, in the fall for uh, uh, bonita, mm. false albacore, uh, kingfish. Um, and again, almost anything that you can catch. Mackerel, shark. mackerel, shark, yeah. Uh, right now, as soon as the water warms up on the beaches, there'll be, uh, it's a good time to catch black tips, small black mm-hmm. tips on flies. Are you sight fishing or are you casting and hoping they, they it's, bite? Or both? It's both. Yeah. Uh, I love to sight fish, but if you watch the waters around Sanibel, it's difficult to have good, clear water right. very often. Mm-hmm. I mean, Especially when it's windy. And right. It's, yeah. One or two days a week is usually what you can expect. The rest of the time, it's cloudy or dirty water. But when it's... when it's Not dirty in particular. No, but, but it's, just, it's, it's, right, just cloudy right. sediment. It's, yeah. it's, gotcha. it's brown. It's yes. different. Than, it's not the <laughs> yes. nice blue turquoise water. We don't want to put that out there. <laughs> right. dirty water. Right. <laughs> but... Um, you can you can fish it's i love to sight cast and just walk the beaches look for fish cast to a fish try to get that fish to eat uh but the fish are there whether the water's clean or dirty and a lot of people don't understand that Mm -hmm. so if and like me i I fish 300 days a year so i want to fish every day so i adapt my fishing to what's there Gotcha. And so if you're only going to sight fish, you're only going to be out there 20% of the time at the most. Right. So, mm-hmm. so if you like to fish, then you adapt to, okay, can I catch these fish in dirty or, dirtier water, unclear water? And then if you do, how do you do it? Right. So are you walking up and down the beach or you stand in one spot? How? What? It depends on the situation. So, okay. um, there's two things. One of them is when, when snook are on the beach in the summer and they spawn on the beaches, off the beaches, they're, they're a backcountry critter for half of their life. They live in the mangroves. They live around structure. They live in dark water. Um, but they spawn off the beaches. And so about this time of the year, once the water gets above 70, 72 in the Gulf, they'll move from the back country out onto the beaches. And they'll be out there for a month to four months, depending upon the fish. And they will spawn and they'll move to the passes and back away from the passes as 
between the moon phases and, and things. Um, and so when they're out there, they're in shallower water. And so when it's clear, you can see them. And particularly when there's bait along the beach, the snook will be up there busting bait in six inches of water. Mm. So they're, they're a fish that you can catch within, I always tell people when you fish that, you fish it like you would a 30 foot wide river, the beach, not mm. as a big bathtub or a big chunk of water. It's a 30 foot wide moving river because there's a current that's usually moving one way or the other along that beach. Yeah. The fish use it just like a river. If you understand that, it makes it easier to figure out where to, where to these fish get narrowed down. Not every foot of beach is the same. So you, are you going past, so typically when you go into the water, you've got a deeper edge and then it will go shallow again and then it will go deeper. Do you, are you trying to, are you I know dolph, dolphin will what, feed in those troughs. Right. What you stay, what you try to do is, and a lot of people don't understand this, most of those fish, no matter what they are, are within that first trough. Right. Mm. And you don't even, when the water is clear, you don't even want to be in the water. You want to be off the water, walking in the dry sand, right. watching for fish out there. Mm. And these fish are like anything else. If you can see them, they can see you. And if you can see them, they've probably already seen you. They're sharper than you are. Right. And snook particularly are, if you can, if you can just anthropomorphize a, a snook, they live in, in, in uh, darker water with a lot of cover for half of the year. Mm -hmm. They move out onto the Gulf of Mexico and it's bright, clear water with no cover and bright sun. It's gotta be a total shock to their system and as yeah. how they function. They use the structure of the sand in the bottom as their structure. So they're, but they're very, very alert to anything over them or anything moving because they are very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as easy to catch them as people would think. You can see a fish, but like I said, if I you can see it, bite. it has seen you. Right. And if you can put something there that it will want to chase, follow, and eat, that's quite a trick sometimes. So does, with fly does, fishing, do you, is it actually just a, a a fly or their food too? they're what they what they call it a fly because originally you know trout fishing and that it was with something to match a fly that was hatching on the water in the streams but a fly is just a generic term for the bait that a fly fisherman uses which is something to imitate whatever food source that the fish you're trying to catch would eat. Okay. And and in the salt water, it's basically something that imitates a bait fish, another fish. Oh, you're making it look like a, so you're looking for glinty things. Right, something stripes, that's shiny, and... that's something that's got a profile that looks like a, a, a fish. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought you still did flies. Right, no, yeah. it, and it's totally different. Or you use the other f thing is shrimp, is another natural food for saltwater fish. And the third one are crabs. So one of those three is what you're trying to imitate. But just to be clear, you're not using shrimp because that would be far too heavy. Right. You're using an imitation, a look -alike. what looks like a shrimp gotcha. or what looks like a crab gotcha. or what looks like a, a oh, bait wow. fish. Mm, incredible. I didn't know that. Yes. I didn't either. So there, and there's a, just this wide variety of, of flies that you can, you can get to to fish and for specific species and in, in particular so, so how does this area saw, rate as one of the uh, as a fly a saltwater fly fishing place if you were this this is a what i would look at as very good because there's such a variety of fish here at throughout the entire year um th again the summer months snooker there but also sea trouts um Spotted sea trout spawn in the summertime also, and they spawn in a little deeper water, but after they spawn, they move up on the beaches to feed on the bait that's there. Um, Jack Cravels will be there, uh, mackerel um, during the summer months, ladyfish. There's a lot of ladyfish, more than you would ever imagine. So those are usually available whenever there's bait. Um, 
getting towards the fall, redfish will start showing up on the beaches, on the, on the Gulf beaches. Um, and tarpon, usually from about now, I saw three tarpon yesterday off the, off the beach. Um, uh, what, and why, they, I know you touched on it, why are they moving out from the back bay to the beach just to spawn? To spawn, to, to spawn, or? To spawn. spawn uh, snook are u- unique in that they are, they're, they're called a protanderous hermaphrodite. Okay, you got to okay, explain that. Okay, the scientific that. <laughs> end. Every snook hatches out as a male. Mm, I've heard okay. this, yeah. But somewhere in their life, and it's usually once they get to be 26 inches or so in length, they start to change into a female. And it's an evolutionary thing that the species has done to compensate because they mass spawn. They just go out in a group and they lay the eggs and the milt together and it merges together and, and it's off on its own forever. Hmm. Nobody protects it. So... It's in the species' best interest to have as many eggs as possible. Right. Mm. The eggs are produced by big fish. So you can almost see how this evolved over time that the big fish that turned into a female have many more eggs than small fish. Gotcha. Right. So that's how they've evolved. But in, in long and short of it is the big fish are basically females. They're out there. The males join up with them. They get in these big aggregates and aggregates and they spawn. Are they catch and release or have they opened it back up? They're catch and release still. We're in the this would be the end of the fourth year of the impacts from the red tide okay. in 2018. So explain that to. So you used to be able to catch them and uh, keep over them? 27 inches, which explains why. Right, and there's yeah. a yeah, and there's a there's a slot limit, and FWC has it's an interesting thing when you come from a northern state to down here, that up, most of the saltwater species have a salt a uh, slot limit. It's a minimum and a maximum, and it's usually set up. The theory is to protect the young fish and the old spawners and allows you to take the group that's kind of one of the largest groups age-wise, but take enough of those to not impact them getting to be older, if you can understand. You, they, yeah. They've got to get beyond that stage to be productive. So it's it's the slot limit is set up and for t- snook it's it's fairly tight it's from 27 to 20 to 32 inches 33 inches here in the gulf so it's a pretty tight yeah. limit yeah. and uh, that's to protect anything over 33 inches 33 and over is is protected so those are the big fish those are the the big females that'll spawn five million eggs a year that's mm. what they want to have out there mm. Um, sea trout are the same way. It's uh, 15 to 19 inches right So now. if you come here, where would you look up to find out where the regulation, because they change yearly too, don't they? Or? No, they're, they're pretty consistent okay. except for the closure. But I mean, the, the regulations are pretty much constant from year to year. What mm. they may change is bag limits, how many you can keep a day or whatever. Um, but the wherever you buy a license or go to one of the sporting goods stores or the fly shop and they'll have the regulations pamphlet there that so you can also get it on florida fish and wildlife right on their website website, and they've got it too and And you do need a license to fish is that correct from the beach yeah Yeah, and and if you're a non-resident you have to have one no matter what age but if you're a florida resident and you're 65 and over you don't need a license ah, a mm-hmm. reason to get yeah. wish to be older reason to get old except <laughs> yes. for the except for the side benefits or, <laughs> right. yeah i wouldn't yeah. wish your life away no. getting no. old right, right. Fishing right. Exactly. yeah yeah half price coffee at mcdonald's too or something <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's right i yeah. saw when i was looking up trivia questions i saw um some of the flies are made to look like rodents uh, mice that is that is with trout fishing. Really? Yeah, in the north. They've found over the years, and probably in the last 20 years particularly, that, that big rainbow trout and big brown trout eat mice, particularly at night. And there's a lot of folks now that go out and just, they call it mousing, and they fish at night in the rivers for big, and this is where they get the big fish, the, you know, really? a, a stream where that has uh, 
five to eight pound rainbows and brown trout. That's when you f- catch them. So where and are, are you? Where are you are throwing it in swimming? the middle of the water or in like shallow? I guess it depends. It, on it doesn't matter. That it's uh, what they found is that those mice, when they fall in the water or try to cross, and they get in the water, they try to swim across, and so they go mm. all the way across. They make a little V, just like a right. So they swim. And, and, oh, the whole yeah. <laughs> group of them. And and those trout have figured out that's a meal. You know, oh over the gosh. years, they Pretty figured it out. So they're crossing canals or small yes. estuaries. Small, yes. Yeah. 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 So oh. what time do you normally fish? What's your, are you up early or is it, again, depending on down, the day? Down here, the interesting thing with fishing is that different than fishing in the north is that you got tides. And tides rule almost any kind of fishing you do. But in general, fishing that first hour, half hour before sunrise and the half hour after is usually good and the same with at sunset half hour before half hour after but the tides can influence that dramatically and Mm -hmm. so in the middle of the day you can have some extremely good fishing if you've got a fast moving tide and so when everybody asks me what when do you fish when the water's moving doesn't matter what time of the day or night. Mm. If if the water is moving good, those fish will be eating. Mm-hmm. If that's pretty much across the board for most types of fish. Yeah. Yes. Do, you, do you keep any of the fish that you now I, you've caught twenty thousand? Use your I, freezer do, stocked. No. <laughs> to give you an idea, I've I've got twenty thousand, and in nine years, I've kept one hundred and ninety-two fish. Really? And most of those are pompano. My wife loves pompano, and so I keep, keep her happy. Yeah, I keep a few pompano, but I wade fish mostly. Ninety percent of my fishing is is wading. I don't fish with a boat or anything else. I'm I'm wading, and if you think about it, in Florida, it's always warm. Where the heck do you put a fish that you catch that you want to keep? Mm. Right. If you're wading, yeah. you, oh, you take right. it and you like put spear fishing. You just put it in a keep in that. You could do that, yeah. <laughs> but if but if you're waiting and you're say a mile away from your vehicle, you got an option. You can either put it on a stringer and drag it along with you in the water as a really good chum line right. for, yep. for sharks, yeah. <laughs> right. or you put it up on the beach. And, and you if you don't have it hidden away, you have ospreys picking it up, right? Or eagles, or if you put it under cover somewhere. When you come back, you'll see that they're usually covered with fire ants. Mm. So no no good options. None of that is very good. So the only fish I catch is when I'm close to a vehicle and I know I can get it from where I'm at to the vehicle on an ice right away. So where would you, I've never seen a permit from the beach or maybe I have, but I didn't know it. Where would you go? So you're going wading for that? Where would you go for that? Like a bunch beach or somewhere like that? When you say permit, I always think in my mind like a piece of paper, you know, like a like a physical permit. Yeah, permit. But, right. Right. No, this is a. Uh, do you know <laughs> a what a fish? Do you want? You know what a pompano looks like? I yeah. They're I like a, a big round silver, silver round, dollar. Yeah. Okay, a, a permit Solid is looking. like that, but it's bigger. And uh, the permit that I catch here. There's not a lot of them on the beaches, but I usually catch three or four or five a year just walking the beaches. We catch permit offshore. From a boat? From a boat. Okay. But they're in deep water, but you can, but quite often around the wrecks and the structure, they'll be up on the surface. And when they get up off the, on the surface, they're vulnerable to being caught with a fly rod. So you're going on a, obviously you've got to be casting from a boat. So you're using like uh, flats boats? Yes. You need a flats boat or a boat that's set up that doesn't have a tower on it or doesn't have a T-top. You and want nothing in the way. You've got right. an open top it, boat. Is it constant? You're yes. Just yes. Presenting, isn't it? You're, pre- you're, you're presenting, you right, gotcha. right. <laughs> and you need to have, you know, in front of you, but you also need line behind you for a back cast. You need forty to sixty feet behind you. Oh wow! That's obstruction free. So mm. I'm guessing it's kind of good exercise too. It, 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 it is, but you really don't do a lot. The <laughs> rod is what does it. That's the trick. Mm. If you're doing a lot, maybe you're doing it wrong. If you're doing a lot of exercise <laughs> and you're not <laughs> doing it right. right. <laughs> okay. Wow, there seems like a lot that goes into this. It, there it, is, and one of the that's you bring up a, an interesting point when you fish the beaches down here. There's beaches that 
in, when you talk about the timing of when you fish. If you fish the Gulf beaches at this time of the year, You're you know what people, it's you know what think. it's like after very far after daylight on any of these beaches, yeah. mm -hmm. in the, and even before daylight, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. But so you've always got to be aware of who's where mm -hmm. and what they're doing because what I've found over the years is that people shelling are in a whole different mode believe me as a photographer on the beach i've i have they will, a lot of oblivious shellers right. behind, they could be standing in between a family right being photographed and they won't even right. realize yeah, yeah or they'll walk over you if you're standing <laughs> yeah. right where they want to be they're trying to find the genonia that's right <laughs> that's right and every they have to search every square inch of the yep. beach as yes. they go exactly stoop, without the looking Sanibel up stoop, they're yep. down and yep. they are not looking up so, so you always if you're fly fishing because of that back cast you've always got to be aware of of where everybody is yeah and not assume that they are paying attention so to you might be hooking yourself a tourist yeah. <laughs> yes yeah you don't want to do that you don't want to do that do you ever fish fish normal rod and reel no never no what's That's the uh, what's the appeal sacrilege. what's yeah. the what's the appeal for fly fishing over regular rod and reel um what i th like is the fact that i can i tie my own fly so i get a lot of satisfaction on taking a bunch of fur fake material putting it on a hook and being able to throw that to a fish and sucker that fish into <laughs> eating it thinking it's something that they want to have right. there's a lot of satisfaction to that and it's tough doing that mm. if you're bait fishing or casting plugs yeah. but i can get there's a lot of situations where i can outfish somebody with casting plugs and even bait. Mm. When snooker on the beach, I can usually outfish somebody that's casting plugs or using bait. Really? To, wow. Yeah, because they're keyed in on specific things when they're on the beach, and if you don't have that to them, you might as well give up. So you have different types of flies. Do you have different lengths of rods? And Does that all go into it too, the, or is it mostly the fly that the, is? The rods are basically the same length, and fly rods are designed and built in what they call weights and the weight is from from say 1 to 12 or 14 and those are the heavier ones and it's it's not on the weight of the rod itself but it's the weight of the line that you throw with the rod mm -hmm. because fly fishing is different than spinning gear or anything the the fly is not what pulls the line out okay when you cast a spinning right. rod and a plug the weight of the plug is what pulls the mono out or the or the braid line out mm -hmm. that makes your cast with a fly rod the weight of the fly line is what casts it i can cast as far without anything on without a fly on there really? as i can with it without it that. just because of the way it's set up and it's the going back to the weights it's the weight of the first 30 feet of the line and how much it bends the rod. And this is a whole thing that the industry More. has. But basically, what you use is, is you have to have enough weight of that line with about 30 feet out so that it, it bends the rod and loads the rod. It puts so energy in it. the rod mm. so that when you go forward with it, that rod, if you've ever watched the the pole vaulters is the best example. Mm -hmm. A pole vault, it's the it's the pole that's bent with the weight of the guy or gal that when it goes up is the spring of the of the pole is what puts them over the bar. Mm -hmm. They ca they can only jump so high, but with a with the pole, they can use that energy to bend the rod that then pushes them up and higher. Same thing with a fly rod. It's the if you're doing it correctly, the rod is designed so that it, it bends with that weight just right so that as you do a back cast and the, the line goes out behind, it loads the rod, it bends the rod. So you get some whip. Then you bring it forward and it keeps that energy and it transfers the energy down that line and the line goes forward and will go out 
you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 feet. Mm. Yeah. So, but that, I've seen that line before and it doesn't look like it's, I mean, I know spinning rods, you're trying to hide that leader, that, right. that first bit of line. Um, it's going to be thicker, but it's also going to be probably monofilament or something that's stronger or thinner or whatever approach you want to take. But that line is quite hefty and quite thick. So how do the fish not see it? Okay, it's heavy to the end of the fly line, but then you put a leader on it. Okay, okay. Then there's a leader after right. that. Right, and there's okay. usually, depending on the line, from uh, 6 to 12 feet of of mono tapered leader oh okay down uh, to whatever weight you want to have and gotcha because you can be hitting some i mean tarpon a 70 100 pounds or you can, right you can get have some you caught tarpon you can go yes. more. i'm sure yeah. and those twenty thousand yeah. fish. no bigger than that yeah dad really yeah oh, 150 I, <laughs> yeah you could you and and again um People are always amazed that that you can catch big fish on a fly rod. It's no different catching them on a fly rod than it is a spinning rod. I mean, you still got a rod that is is designed also to to fight and handle a big fish. You just have to understand how to use the rod. That rod is made. It's, if it's a nine foot rod, which is a typical length, that last uh, two and a half feet of the rod, the tip of it is what's designed to bend with the weight of the line. Right. But the rest of that rod tapers tapers to a large butt section. That butt section is made to handle the big fish. Gotcha. So what you need to do is that you don't fight fish with your rod up so that they're fighting off of the, the mm. bendable part of the rod. <clears throat> you point the rod more at them and make the energy come back so that they're fighting on that heavy part Thicker of the rod. Part. Oh, it makes sense. Yeah, it yeah. makes sense. Wow. wow. That's cool. So there's a lot of, a lot of things yeah. to it, of, but it's yeah. it's not Physics, as I it's guess. not as difficult as it sounds. <laughs> right. Oh gosh. So I know Norm when he had the shop, he um and we'll talk about that in a second, but Norm um we're thinking of you Norm. Norm's uh, Norm's recently Ziegler. uh Norm Ziegler's recently uh, retired and um his Close partner's the shop closed his shop and he's now reopening it but uh where was i going with that i don't know, don't know. well let's just talk so whitney well, we talk who, about that. right yeah. so uh whitney who has whitney's bait and tackle i think it's the name of his shop Correct. which is close to here is um has taken over norm's space right on and tell right. everybody what's going to go on in there well whitney whitney has always wanted to have a fly shop somewhere here he's a he's a fly fisherman he's a heck of a trout fisherman from out west he's goes out there several times a year to fish trout but he's he's always wanted to have a shop when norm decided to retire he did end up selling that the shop and and the contents of the shop to whitney whitney had also then worked out a deal once he found that of re renting that building so that's been his goal and in the uh i think it was october is when the transfer the purchase of the of the shop turn, took place so norm's shop will live on it will be it'll be in the form of uh it'll be it'll be a new shop it'll well, be it'll be sanibel fly outfitters okay is what it's going to be called and whitney's going to run it and um they had worked out a deal i don't know how it's going to happen with with norm whenever he wants to he can come there and sign books and tie flies or whatever awesome oh. okay here's where i was going i remembered the question ha. i was going to have <laughs> <laughs> so norm used to do he used to have a fly fishing lesson if you bought a rod and reel through him right um is that going to be a thing still now i mean ha i guess the question is if you were coming to the island and you wanted to do a crash course in fly saltwater fly fishing how would you go about it um Two ways, but I, most of the people that come here are, are, you know, I worked in Norm's shop for like eight years and talked to a whole lot of people that fly fish and come into the shop and you can put them into some categories that they're seasoned, experienced saltwater fly fishermen that have done it here before or fish somewhere in Florida or somewhere in saltwater. They've heard it was good. They wanted to try it. They come in they're geared up with everything they need except flies they want local flies that were tied locally that are used here and a suggestion for leaders and things like that 
Then you get a group of people who are the tourists group that come down with the kids or whatever for vacations and they see a fly shop. They'd never thought about saltwater fly fishing, but they fly fished their entire life in the north for whatever. They see a fly shop, they come down, they want to know, can I do that here? So there's that group of people. And then you get people who just come down and say, can we fly fish here? You know, I didn't know we could fly fish. What, and if they'd never fly fish for anything, they, what do I need to have mm -hmm. to fly fish? So they're starting from scratch. Which So you got this wide variety. But the bulk of the people that you run into at the fly shops are somebody who has fly fished at least somewhere. Mm. So it's easier to deal with them and, and easier to provide them with, with things. So you don't get a lot of the people that come down and say, geez, I want to fly fish. What do I need to do? <laughs> right. You know, how do I how do so I?" So it's not a place for beginners then? It, it, it is, it is, mm. but but the the biggest trick with a beginner is just learning how to cast the fly rod, mm. and it's not as difficult as you would think. But it does, it's like it's some finesse. Probably. It's a little more difficult than just picking one up and, you know, All like right. anybody can pick up a spinning rod and after they screw with it a little bit, they can throw something out there a ways mm. enough to cast. But, um. I think Max fell off his chair. <laughs> we lost Max. Yeah, we, 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 I just want to I, explain. I we, do, every time. We, we do have Max back. Oh, he's kept back. He came back yeah. on. His camera I, yeah. just came back on. I, uh, cool. I, I get yelled at every over. time at the end of every episode. He's, I kick the got chair his belt, and he, melt thing around his body. It rattles. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's fine. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought. Oh well, we got a, we the trash him. guys came. Oh goodness. So I'm not sure where we were, but just saying it is a little bit more difficult. So can you? fly rods yes any of the places down here that have fly fishing equipment or any of the fly shops can you can rent equipment there a lot of them have somebody that will give you some instruction um and there's we have down here a, a joe Mahler. i don't know if you've heard of joe but he lives in fort myers he's probably one of the top fly fishing instructors in the country he's, oh, wow. he's just a tremendous guy tremendous personality that's somebody that if I was going to come down here and wanted to learn to fly, f learn to cast, or to just kind of get a, a better idea of how to cast better, I'd get with somebody like that okay. and spend a morning, right. yeah. a, couple, oh, cool. a couple hours, and just go out and cast. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if you have cast in the past, just to get a tune-up so right. that you, you get your rhythm back and you understand what's going on better. Hmm. Um, and how about joining your club? Tell everybody about that. How do they find you? Well, and that was the third thing I was going to oh, say gotcha. is get with, go to one of the fly shops or if there's a local club, get a handle on the local club and try to get a hold of somebody from that and talk to someone and kind of get in, in with that. Um, and we've got, a, we've got a website and we're on Facebook. We're on a lot of stuff, but okay. what's, what's uh, the web website? It's sanibelff.org. Sanibelff.org. Fly fishing. Don't the O R G. Yeah. Yep, it's right. a simple one, and it'll it'll get you there, and that'll get you to the a uh, uh, page where everything you need will be there. Right. And That's how right. much to join your club? It's it's a whole twenty five bucks a year. Wow. Woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> Bowsers. Yeah. yeah. So, well. yeah, we don't make a lot of money on our membership on our no dues. Kidding. On our dues. <laughs> but it sounds like you have a good time. We have a good time. We've This year particularly, we've had, uh, and I didn't talk about earlier, but we usually have some outings during the October through March, early April period. And we try to get together with uh, a group together to fish kayaks, fly fish with kayaks, and fly fish somewhere on the beaches. And in the wintertime, we, we've been talking about the snook on the beach, but in the wintertime, there's no snook on the beach in the Gulf. They're, the water's too cold. They're back in the back country where it's warmer water. So the places that you fly fish then are on, say, the inside, we call the inside, the sound side of Sanibel, the grass beds there, or off of... Um, you doing boat 
Oh, are you doing it by boat? Or I you, wade. He's a wader. You can, you can wade. So you wade in off of Summerlin there? Uh, uh, yeah, where do you go? On well, he doesn't want to give away spots. On, no. <laughs> know. You know, everybody says, well, God, you got secret spots. Yeah. How can you have a secret spot on a 12-mile island, island right. that's overrun with people? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, so you, there are places in the winter the fish are there. You're not going to get very many snook mm. wading because they're in the, the creek mouths and stuff back in the mangroves, that's tough to get to. But uh, wading, say, from the causeway, from, uh, as an example, from the uh, fishing pier mm -hmm. towards the causeway. Right. Okay, on just that, on that, on that beach, beach right there. Yeah. Yeah. If you can get access to it, um, that can be some good fishing. And you can get redfish, uh, sea trout, um, occasionally snook there. The snook has started to show up again right now. but. And ladyfish, so you can you can go along there and, and do fairly well. So you still want edges. You don't want you don't want to be in open water. Right. Right. Okay. So right. going out just because it's shallow will not help you. No. You're no. looking for the terrain or for the right. hiding places where these fish will be. Right. The, the, the one thing I learned as a biologist in all my training, and that's why when I look at fishing, I look at it differently than most people. Mm -hmm. I look at it from the bio, biologist standpoint and say, if I'm here. Is there a reason that there would be fish here? Right. Knowing that fish need to have food and some kind of cover. Cover type shelter of things. from predators, yeah. yeah. And that's what I look at when I step close to the water. And when I look at that, I look at where is that here? And if I find that kind of a situation and I don't catch fish, then I'm always thinking, okay, why are they not here now? Because you're a bad scientist. Right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I see a book. I think, Pete, you need to write a book, I think. But, All but, this data you've compiled, yeah. I can see a book coming out yeah. soon. But what you have, though, in those situations is the tide. The tide is that mm, one so thing that changes. Yeah, one element. And, and these fish, what I've found is that they'll only be in real shallow water at certain times of the year for certain reasons, and that's basically because there's bait there, mm. and they're up there filling themselves up chasing bait around in six inches of water they'll do that in the winter time but in the winter time the bait is not there it's usually out further so they're out these fish are along the grass beds picking up crabs and shrimp out of the grass mm -hmm. so it's a totally different this is the same fish but the fish have switched their oh, diet. so they will go to the sea to yes the, to the sea grass and right but they're only going to be there when the water's deep enough Gotcha. Wow, okay. this is a lot yeah, of information. I, I, yeah. well, that, that's right. I, yeah. It, it yeah. is, but I mean, that's I spend a lot of time doing it. Right. Do you fish to get blind? I'm thinking about the places that people fish. Blind pass. Yeah. Would you go there? Yeah. The fishing pier. Uh, I don't fish it. I don't fish the fishing pier, but I fish either side of it. Okay. How about the rocks? The rocks. Would, yes. Um, yep. West yep. Gulf up there, yep. Naps uh, Point. Yeah, off, the off of Bowman Beach, Bowman's. I fish both directions from Bowman's. I fish... Uh, Silver Key. Uh, yep, I fish from Blind Pass and come south to Silver Key and, and beyond. I fish at Turner Beach, the Captiva side, yeah. from that next... Uh, mile and a half from the pass north on mm -hmm. Captiva. So yeah. basically we're Allison the quieter Hager. points yes. <laughs> of the yes. beaches. Yeah. Yes. Right. Smart but, move. <laughs> yeah, you've got to, again, but in, in summer, when the beach traffic is down, you can fish most of most these of the beaches, beaches yeah. without a lot of problem, particularly right. early in the morning. So yeah. there's not a lot of people out there. Yeah. Nice. Fantastic. So what awesome. in the world brought you to Sanibel from Michigan, right? Is that yes. where you're from? Well, it's kind of an interesting story. My wife is, her uncle built one of the original resorts on the island. Which is? Which is now, it is 4015. Oh, okay. Which yeah. is part of Mitchell, Mitchell Sand Sandcastle. Castle yeah. and that. But he built that originally back in the early 50s. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And okay. uh, why was it called 4015? Well, that, was that the address? That was the new people that took it over. But it was originally called Casa de Casa when he built it back in the in the early 50s. What did that mean? Uh, house, uh, house of, of uh, something. Yeah. Queso. Cheese. Yeah. Che house of no. cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. that I'd, I'd go there. White house cheese. of cheese. <laughs> but but my no, wife. That's White House, Dad. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah. My wife grew up coming down to Sanibel. Her, 
her dad and her dad helped build those original cottages and stuff. And so she grew up coming down here on spring breaks, Christmas break, and during the summer. And she had two cousins that grew up on the island that, you know, went back and forth on the ferry and that whole mm. nine yards. So yeah. she loved the island. Yeah. And so when we got together, she said, I got to show you this place at Sanibel. And my folks at that time were living in Lakeland. And I'd been to Lakeland and mm -hmm. I thought that part of the state actually sucked. <laughs> I hate to say that, but I mean, it's yeah. it, in the summertime, especially the in, inner it's parts different. of Florida are not Awful. a place that you, no. are yeah. made for people to be. No, Holiday people. I, I, yeah, yes. I always wonder why people come to Florida and live yeah. there. So, the so anyway, I, that was, buy. yeah, that was my experience with Florida. I thought, man, okay, well, she said, let's, let's go. I want to show Trust you me. Sanibel. Right. That was it. And. At that time, I never operated in a temperature much above 70. It was too hot for me. <laughs> right. And for the first probably six or eight years we came down here, um, I never did anything except sit in a, air in a room in air conditioning <laughs> and go out at night and walk the beaches. But I quickly found after I got looking that there's some neat fish here. And then I thought, well, maybe you can catch these fish. Yeah. And sure. once I got hooked on that, then I decided, <laughs> well, okay, let's let's do this and let's let's go down there more often. And about oh, it was 10, 12 years ago, we started renting a house on West Gulf and we were coming for a month and then two months and then three months. Then we bought a condo over in Fort Myers. And so we were coming down more regularly, and now I'm down here nine or ten months of the year. I'm still, in theory, a resident of Michigan, but I'm here basically ten months of the year. Really? really? So you live in Fort Myers, but you come over every day, almost, almost every day. Almost every day. days I'm, out of the year. Yeah, you're almost here on every Santa day Ball. I'm over on Santa Ball. Sounds like us. Yeah. <laughs> Do you ever go to Bunch Beach? Yep, I fish Bunch Which quite a, a bit. Which is a beach off of, uh, in right. Fort Myers. Yes, and I fish down off of uh, Lover's Key. Mm. at the state Four park beach, right. yeah. down to uh barefoot beach you know all the way down through it's there yeah um i've fished uh there's some really nice access if you if you can figure out where they're at to to wade fish uh burnt store oh, okay. there's a big yeah. bar that runs okay. from yeah. burnt star marina south yeah and there's oh, i know that because i've i've flown paramotors over there and you can see it from the air yeah and there's yeah. three places where there's foot access to to get mm -hmm. to the water there's a small park south of uh burnt storm marina that, right and there's room for a few cars and then you have to go through all the right through the undergrowth to get to it yeah. right now that sounds like a secret place it is because i saw it from the air like i looked down and i was like what is that car doing parked in the middle of nowhere and right. then all of a sudden these the people came out on the other side of all this mangroves just on a tiny tiny little beach had it to themselves i was right. like i've got to find out where that is yeah. yeah there's hardly any beach but it's shallow it's mm -hmm. for a, almost a half a mile yeah. you can wade out from yeah. from mm. those mangroves yeah, and there's like I say, there's three of those places along there. They're they're uh, uh, FWC access points right. that that are on the maps and stuff, but not many people are aware of them. And, and frankly, a lot of people don't want to walk through the mangroves. It's kind of to get yeah. There. It's right. it's uh, gotcha. it's yeah. yeah it's what? you're on your own. It's yeah. Yeah, and and a lot of the times when you've got higher tides, that walk is all in the water. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's not, it's not deep water, water, but it's yeah. you know, it's it's like. Uh, and just, imagine buggy. Too. Yes, it can be really buggy up there because yeah. nobody sprays there. It's, no, right. there's so, no reason mm, to. Maybe I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> you but can have that, spot. but it's yeah. beautiful when you get there. Yeah, I mean, you is. have, you have this, it to yourself. this whole thing. Yeah. You have it to wow, there's so See much. Well, you, we need to go out with you because this is. I yeah. Think so it there's a lot fun. of places here that you can fish if you wade, and people say, "Well, God, you know, are there that many places?" Yeah, there are, and yeah. because of the shape of sanibel which is unique you know it's a it's a barrier island but mm -hmm. it's not parallel to the beach it's that it's yeah. that hook shape boomerang shape mm -hmm. if you will and so almost any weather situation there's somewhere on this island that you can fish mm -hmm. that's on the lee side of the wind now there's occasions where the tide's too high and the wind's in the wrong direction that you can't really fish 
well, but basically there's there's somewhere on any given day that I could fish here on this island. So if your wife wants to find you, she knows where to. She does. She she's got to. She's got to find my phone deal on her <laughs> All app. Right. Like, All right, Max. Pete? What you got for us? Oh. All right, trivia time. Are you ready, Pete? Okay, here okay. you go, Pete. <laughs> All right. Last. Oh, gosh. These we are fly fishing racer. questions. So, Pete, if you lose, eraser. prepare for embarrassment. Okay? Yes, because you know a lot about yeah. fly fishing. No, they should be. Uh, we'll see how they go. I think Pete will know this one right off the bat. And I, All right. So just write your answer down, and then we'll reveal them this afterwards. One, um, yeah. What is the difference between a wet fly and a dry fly? Well, that seems pretty obvious, but maybe it's not. <laughs> Best definition wins. <laughs> so maybe it's not obvious. I don't obviously. know. You tell. You, you write it down. You can write you, you the gist and then explain it in words if you want. Uh, oh. uh, okay. Yeah, we need some baby okay. music. I obviously I went for the obvious thing because I can't think of anything else. Okay, got it. You yep. got it, Nick? Yep. You have, right, you have about then. a quarter of the words that Pete does. <laughs> no, I'm right. just putting notes. <laughs> All right. Then you go first, Nick. Wait, no, Mom. You, you go it. first. You said All it was right. obvious. No, I just said one is unused, dry. One is used, wet. Incorrect. <laughs> Incorrect. I didn't. I put wet emulates an underwater bait. What is a dry? What's dry? One that lands on top of the water and stays on top of the water. Pete? Well, it's it's basically it's the same thing of floating versus sinking, but it's what it represents. And this this the the dry fly is something that represents something floating on the surface, and a wet fly is 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 something that represents a food source underneath the surface. That's why I said thank you. <laughs> but, all right, points for both of you. Points for both of you. Wow. Thank you. you. Thank you for explaining in greater detail, Pete. But Dad, I'll give I you gave, a point. Gave, you were close I gave enough. You the layman's terms. Yeah. Did you know that? No, I guessed? totally guessed. You've been yes. researching fly fishing. No. All right. Well no. done. All right. Here we go. We're going for some history now. Uh-huh. What empire is said to have been said to have been home to the first Fly fishing in the second century. Empire? Yep. I it is no I don't even one know. One empire. <laughs> There's one person that was in this in this empire that Well the one I was gonna that started fly write fishing, down, apparently. Probably not what and uh, it well. has to be true because I read it on the internet. Already. Um, and Pete will confirm, I guess, if he writes something. <laughs> basically where did fly fishing start? start. Hmm. All right, we need an answer, Nick. I'm trying to think of where they might have found flies, and I was thinking Egyptians, but the Egyptians didn't have, really have much water because they were... Oh, yeah, they had the, the Nile. The Nile. No, I'm going to have the Egyptians. Of course they <laughs> Okay. I was thinking... <laughs> Cleopatra. I was, yes. Okay, uh, Egyptians, I'm staying. I went for Roman because I thought, I thought of in a Roman empire. I, Pete? I'm, I'm going to say the Chinese because I think they were doing that kind of stuff That's way a good back answer. When. Roman Empire, modern okay. day Rome, is where. Is I got where, it. Yes. Yes, you did, Laura. You, you, well, you guessed it. You, you I guessed, guessed it. it. <laughs> yes. All right, ties across the board. One, one, according one. to the internet, Woo. according to the internet, oh. the first fly fishing was in modern day Rome. Okay. I knew that. Yep. Okay. I knew right. that. So, in 200 <laughs> uh, AD. Excellent. AD, BC, one of the things. One of those things. <laughs> but it's kind of a big. Who difference. knows if that's true or not? I think they even had a name for him. I should have. I should have written down his name. Hmm. All right. All right. Is this the last question? Nope. There's two more. Okay. Go. Caught. This is a three-way tie, by the way. So this is serious. This is serious. This is serious. Caught by Richard Hart in Guyana in 2015. This Arapaima. Arapaima. Arapaima? Arapaima. Arapaima? I, I got it. Yeah. I got it. Is the heaviest freshwater fish <laughs> ever caught on fly, weighing in at how many pounds? Okay, so how heavy was this fish that this dude caught yep. in Guyana? Closest gets it. Where did he catch it? That's important. Guyana, in the Rua River. This is important. Okay. Yes. How heavy was this fish? I'm trying to think of what it um, uh, I think Richard Hart, because what I've seen it in is kilograms. 
Oh gosh. Oh man. Yeah. Oh, I would love to help yeah, you. Yeah, with that tell my dad he'll be able to <laughs> do the conversion. Don't, don't surprise yourself if I don't, because it's actually a draw. <laughs> <laughs> oh let's let's go uh, if you want you know what you can write it in kilos and i will do the conversion for you because i have the computer it's the you it, it's the largest freshwater fish yes or just freshwater fish, fish. Okay. yeah that's the difference i've seen difference? i've seen conflicting oh maybe but, I mean, i've seen i've seen a, like seen a, a saltwater fish that seemed to be bigger but i'm not sure now. i saw on one website that somebody had caught a um, a tiger shark that was massive, but I only found no. This was a salt a saltwater fish. Okay, Nick, what'd you but, get? I got two hundred seventy one pounds. I put I, when I peeked, I thought it had said twenty seven. Oh my god! Admittedly <laughs> cheating. Admitted cheating. <laughs> so then I changed mine to forty seven. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you got oh, it way off because I would have had to DQ you, you anyway. DQ <laughs> Pete, what you got? Well, I got 580. 580. You are the closest. It's 416. Yeah, it was uh, 416. Wow. No, that's kilograms, Max. No, no, no. That's, 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 <laughs> I, I did that specifically. Yeah. So apparently there was a. T I saw one website that somebody caught a tiger shark, which would have been the heaviest fish ever, but. Yeah. I only saw it on one website, so I went with freshwater fish. There's a picture of Richard Hart catching. How much? Four hundred and eight, uh, sixteen pounds. Is Richard Hart the guy that does the uh, river monster? Talk? No, no, no. Yeah, okay, that's a different guy. Okay. And what kind of fish? You don't know. Er Arapaima. Arapaima. It's Never a really weird it. looking. Yeah, it's like a catfish type fish. Oh, like a huge. It's got one. The body and the tail all merge into one side. Oh, I know. Right. I've seen that. Yeah. Huh. Right. Have you ever tried to catch an arapaima? Have you been to Guyana to no. go fishing? <laughs> no. 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 Put that on your list. Yeah. So not, right. not 47 pounds. Definitely not. No. Okay. no. What's your biggest fish by weight? You have it in your list. On a fly rod? On a fly rod. Um, go on. Don't pretend you don't know. There's your ledger. Well, I haven't weighed it because of tarpon um mm. probably 45 pounds gotcha what's your most impressive fish your your trophy catch do you have one probably the 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 best one that i've got which is kind of unique was a a uh roughly 30 or 20 pound uh triple tail wow that i caught from the beach which is unusual because they don't normally come this close in right yeah Wow, and that wow. would have been good eating. Did you eat that one? I didn't. I let that one go. I felt I really, felt that was fart. a tough one because gotcha. I, I love triple tail. Yeah, I do. And it was right by the axe. It was at the rocks. Right. Oh, really? And I and I, I was within uh, 200 yards of my vehicle and I could have thrown it in there. It was 30 inches long from the tip of the tail to the nose. Great and eating, it was a triple tail. Big yeah. fish. But I just couldn't Your heart kill it i put it right. back good for you yeah. good for you good 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 good, good. wow all right What's final score? question score. um oh it's two two pete, pete, one no pete leads i had two with a roman empire oh okay pete and mom this is for <laughs> the, <laughs> the win for the win dad you can tie if you want um <laughs> i had a lot of fun looking at fishing records so we're going away from fly fishing and just going to regular rod and reel now the heaviest fish ever caught on rod and reel at 3,427 pounds was what species? Pete's going for it. It was caught. He's right down writing. Yeah, everybody's wary of you now, Laurie. <laughs> it was caught by a man named Frank Mundus. Where? I don't know. I didn't write that part down. In the water. <laughs> and yeah, in the water. <laughs> okay, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> 3, 000, a 3,000 pound fish. Yes. Pete said Alison Hager. What was it? Is yeah. It, is, is, <laughs> Vice president. <laughs> <laughs> is a shark a fish? <laughs> oh, no. We can't comment. <sighs> Can you see through my board? You might be able to see what I've written right there. <laughs> well, I know that's not right. Oh, okay. I'm going for this. Okay. Go ahead, Mom. I put grouper. That was just so unbelievably wrong. I've no, never seen that. There's wrong, and then there's, there, the there's scale just wrong. a whole another level of wrong. <laughs> Dad, you, could, I, you showed I, us tiger shark. You're wrong. Okay, Pete. How about bluefin tuna? Incorrect. Oh. oh, it is 
of the, a great white shark. Okay. No, why? The man really? who caught this fish, okay. Frank Mundus, yep. is supposedly the inspiration for Quint in Jaws. And yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. What was he using for bait? A whole I think tree? Is he the guy that said, uh, <laughs> we're going to need a bigger boat? Yes. Yeah. That That's was. Frank Mundus. And he oh. caught a 3,500 pound great white shark. shark. <laughs> the <laughs> largest fish ever caught. Wow. Yeah. Yep. All right. Wow. So we tied, right? Fi- yeah, All tied. Right, you guys can ring go. the bell. <laughs> what a blessing. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. I uh, just wanted to uh, mention, uh, Pete, if you're listening, or if anybody's listening and what, not watching, uh, Pete's got a uh, scarf on that's from Captains for Clean Water. Captains for Clean Water. Uh, great uh, charity. It's a charity we support. Uh, we give them free advertising on the website, so go and check them out if you can. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, it's very kind of you. Very interesting. Thank you. I enjoyed it today. Yeah. This was, yeah. this was fantastic. Fun. All right. Make sure you come back and join us on the next one. That's all for now. Thanks very much. Okay, and a quick shout out to our supporters. Without our supporters, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Ladies General Store, Doc Ford's Rum Bar and Grill, Spoon Drift Island Bowls, Three Crafty Ladies, Gator Bites, Taylor Nail, Priscilla's of Sanibel, Coco Cabana, Suncatcher's Dream, and Sanibel Cup. And don't forget to reach out to Captain Water, one of our favourite island charities. Thanks very much. See you on the next one.